So it is now my utmost pleasure to introduce you to Professor James Jibisi. Um, James is one of the most accomplished astronomers I know, and he's also a scary smart person. So James actually originates from Nigeria, um, but he studied in Japan and completed his PhD in 2013 in um, Kagoshima University. Um, James, I hope I uh, pronounced that correct. Yeah. The title of his thesis was actually um, Panoramic Interstellar Gas and Dust Observational Study of Massive Star Formation Based on Accurately Estimated Distances. And for all of you wondering right now, yes, he is fluent in Japanese. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting James when he joined Sarayo in 2017 and has since had the pleasure to be part of his orbit. Um, I know James is an expert in massive star formation and um, on a daily basis continue myself to learn from him. He is currently an associated professor at Northwest University in Pochevstrom. And um, as I said, James has a commanding CV and among numerous grants and rewards, he also has a laundry list of publications. Um, the most recent publications in his uh, publication, his prolific research career, um, is um, this nature paper um, on black hole jets. And this is the topic of his presentation this afternoon. Um, James, we are honored to have you and we are looking forward to your talk. Good evening, everyone. And for those who are in Asia, I, I learned there are a couple of people from India. It must be very early hours of the morning for you. Good morning. Uh, my name is James Chibweze. We can ignore all the other things that will be said. Let's focus on understanding what happens to the jets that black holes launch when they interact with magnetic field and what is the source of this magnetic field. I'll try to break this down as much as I can so that everybody will understand it. But please, if you have questions, I will be available to try to answer all your questions as much as I can. Okay, um, Ruby has said the most part of this. I was born in this tiny location here in the southeastern part of Nigeria, a place called Aba. I did my bachelor's and master's at the University of Nigeria, and then I flew all the way to Japan to do PhD at Kagoshima University, after which I worked as an assistant professor at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan in Tokyo at the East Asian Alma Regional Center working on the ALMA project. And then I moved back to the University of Nigeria to teach as a lecturer and moved to Sarao to join Ruby, working on the different telescopes we have in Africa, and as well as the Meerkat. And then after two years, I moved to Northwest University where I currently work as an associate professor. So I think I will congratulate all of you, uh, probably including myself, that in the past, decade, we have seen a lot of instruments spring up in Africa, like the salt telescope, which you can use to do your optical astronomy. Of course, you can fairly easily um, do spectroscopy with this instrument. It's, it's an impressive instrument. Hardbeast tube has been there for many years. It's a 26 meter radio telescope which we've used to discover quite a number of phenomena, which I will not focus on in this talk. And there is a sister telescope also on the same site that is 15 meters in diameter, which we used to do mostly geodesy. Geodesy is um, just trying to locate positions accurately on the surface of the earth and try to measure how it is moving, um, what you call tectonic plate movement. So this, this telescope can do that. And recently, uh, the, I spent two years doing science commissioning on this instrument in Ghana. Uh, the two meter telescope is up and alive. I, there are recent data coming from this instrument. Of course, this is a beautiful new baby, the Meerkat, which is chunking out quite impressive science. There is a HERA project co-located um, on the Meerkat side. There is the high energy, um, observatory in Namibia, which you call the HES telescope. There is a C-band or sky survey telescope done in collaboration with uh, universities in the United States. And there is the Entoto optical ob uh, observatory, which has, uh, I think, a one-meter telescope. I visited this site a couple of years ago. 
And there is the upcoming HIRAS telescope. Uh, this is the design plan. Uh, happily, this instrument has gotten funded and should be able to start doing science in a couple of years. Of course, you may have heard the news that um, two or three days ago that SKA has received a green light to go ahead and start the construction phase of the SKA. Of course, you know that Miakat, or if you don't, just know that Miakat will one day become fully integrated into the SKA and there wouldn't be Miakat and SKA, there will just be SKA, which Miakat will be part of it. Um, I've put in that image there to show you just a glimpse of what Miakat can do. Beautiful, impressive image of the black hole that um, is in the center of our galaxy, which is the Milky Way. If you observe it in radio waves, uh, you see this bright spot. Uh, that it is bright doesn't mean black holes give out red light. This is just radio emission coming from processes that are excited by the black hole. And prominent of them is this tiny filament you see, which till date, we do not know what that, those things are. They are really huge, um, really long filaments. Anyways, that's not the focus. We are not looking at our black hole today. We look at black hole of a different galaxy. There is another one that I'm um, very keen um, about, that is to have a very long baseline interferometry. Uh, you must have been told a lot of things about the MIACAT, which is cool, uh, but MIACAT's longest baseline at the moment is about eight kilometers. That is very short if you want to do high resolution studies. If you want to do very high resolution in the principle of interferometry, you need the baseline to be very long. Therefore, your angular resolution becomes very small, which we call high angular resolution. So if you can imagine that we put telescope somewhere in the north, northern part of Africa and, put, and use it with Hatrao and a few other telescopes, we will achieve the longest baseline of 7,000 kilometers. And that will be sufficient to give you impressive resolution. Okay. So this is what we want to call African VLBI network. Um, the original plan was to convert redundant dishes. These were all, all the satellite images you see are all telecommunication dishes located at the spots you see on the African map. And the Ghanaian one is this one. So I've just shown you this image. If I go one step back, that telescope there is that little baby. And the interesting thing is on this side, there are two other telescopes. There is one here, there is another one here. These two were built by the Japanese and still at the moment not being used. Only this one has been converted to radio telescope. Well, I may not recommend that you do conversion because it's expensive. It can be tricky, can be hard, uh, can get a bit messy, but in any case, if we get telescopes around this part, patches of the continent, we can do African VLBI network, can do very long baseline interferometry. Okay, now to the science. Ruby did mention that um, my PhD thesis was on doing studying high mass star formation. That is still my first love in terms of science. Um, I still keep studying how massive stars are born. When we say massive stars, we are saying stars that are eight times and above the mass of our sun. Our sun is about 10 to the power 30 kilograms. Okay. You will consider that to be heavy, but that's not heavy at all. We have stars that are 100 times that mass. So I look at how these big stars are formed. And just to give you a short story before we go to the real science for today, those stars originate from giant molecular cloud. This is just a huge cloud of gas and dust. And somehow this cloud, because the um, density is not uniform. For example, if you consider this to be a huge cloud with gas and dust in it, you see this color scale is column density. So if it's so dark, it has less column density. If it's whitish, it has white, uh, higher column density. And you see it's not uniform here. 
So that non-uniformity is what will lead to what you call gravitational collapse. And well, cloud cloud collision could also happen in the process. And I will show you in a simulation. So you will see this cloud gradually collapse by itself or some sub cloud within the cloud will collide with each other to form what we call filaments. This is an example of a filament coming from Herschel telescope. And here you will see tiny filaments. Uh, there will be a zooming very soon. Okay, so these tiny strips of things are what we call filaments, filamentary structures. And if you focus on this patch, you'll see that the filaments will gain some level of angular momentum and start spinning around. And this spinning will lead to fragmentation. You can see tiny little cores coming out from this uh, filament. So we call that fragmentation of the filaments and that gives rise to what we call cold cores. These cold cores carry on the angular momentum they acquire from their rotation. Therefore, if, you, if they keep spinning around, um, you will eventually get uh, what we call angular momentum. Or you remember centrifuge in your chemistry. I'm, I'm trying to use the best term that will work. So if you put some kind of chalk material in water and spin it around long enough in what we call centrifugal motion, the dust or the chalk particles will settle to the ground, to the bottom of your container. So that's what this does. Uh, they live inside a reservoir of material, gas and dust, and as they spin around, they accrete materials into themselves. Therefore, they can grow in their mass. So if you accrete more material, then the number of particles within the forming star becomes higher. The higher the number of particles, the more each particle collide with another one. The more you have collision, the more the temperature will rise. So the temperature within the core will increase as a result of accretion of more materials. And then it will give rise to hot cores. Hot cores we can observe in millimeter wavelengths and you see lines that define an object as a hot core. Then this will get so hot that the hydrogen, which is the major component of a star will start to be broken into two because it's hot enough, you can dissociate hydrogen into an electron and a proton. And when you have this kind of dissociation, you give rise to what we call free-free emission. Free-free emission is just those kind of emission you get when a positively charged ion here attracts a free moving electron and bends it back. If this is moving straight, if it comes close to the positively charged ion, this is negatively charged, this will attract it. Therefore the path, instead of being straight, would bend towards this guy. Okay, so you get free free emission and those free free emission will be so small because the ionization will start from the central part that is the densest where you have the most collision. And when it's still very small, we call it hypercompact H2 region. When there is more ionization of hydrogen and this H2 region increases in size, we call it ultra compact H2 region. When it increases more, we call it a classical size H2 region and we have extended H2 region. So H1 is neutral hydrogen, H2 is ionized hydrogen. Um, that may have been mentioned to you in the past. So this is examples of um, ultra compact H2 regions. You can see they are typically very small and they're detected at centimeter wavelengths. Now, it is impossible to keep swallowing material and stay stable without removing material. This is normal principle in life. You cannot acquire lots of energy and stay in a stable state. For example, if you are asked to run from where you are 500 meters and run back to your seat, you would run and acquire kinetic energy. If you run back to your seat, you already have acquired kinetic energy. You need to give that away to come down to ground state again. 
So giving away material when you accrete is part of the procedure that stars grow. They accrete material, it causes some level of instability, especially because the star is spinning. Therefore, they have to eject some of this material in what you call outflows and jets. Outflows are slower in velocity, jets are high velocity. They're usually hundreds of kilometers every second. And this is one example in CPS A, where you have this um, centimeter emission in white observed with VLA showing uh, a jet launched from a massive star here, and the jet is moving at approximately 500 kilometers every second. And I wish we can travel at jet speed. I can just easily, in two seconds, be or three seconds, be in Cape Town, do whatever I want to do, travel at the same speed back to Porch one day. Okay, so this procedure continue uh, while it ionizes until the star lights up and starts burning hydrogen. And of course, it suddenly explodes and dies. And everything I have described now would happen in only a few million years. Yes, for you, you think it's a very long time, but that's not true because the sun, which is a very small star, one solar mass star, has lived over 4 billion years and has another 4 billion plus years to live. But a massive star, from the beginning of its birth to the time it dies, it's only a few million years, max five, six million years. And that is really short. So it is difficult for us to find different phases of evolution of massive stars in order to study them. So that's what makes it interesting. The fact that it's not common, it's difficult, therefore it's interesting to study. I'll close the case on star formation because Ruby mentioned there are people who are doing star formation. I decided to spend a few minutes on this. So now I'll leave this and talk to you about the interesting results about active galactic nucleus or what we call AGNs. And these are radio galaxies with black holes in the center. What are they? This is what they look like in terms of schematics. They are usually associated with spiral galaxies. And in the center, they have black holes. If, if you look at it face on, you see a disk. If you look at it edge on, you see nearly a line like this. And there is the black hole. Black hole, again, is something we don't know what it is. We just know anything that comes around it gets sucked in. Of course, this guy can keep swallowing things forever. It also launches high velocity jets traveling at thousands of kilometers every second. In fact, for some of them, the jets are faster than the speed of light. Again, I'm happy to answer questions about that later. I'm sure your question will be, hmm, is there really something that moves faster than the speed of light? Yes, there is. Um, there are black holes that launch jets that are super, super fast. Okay, so what I'm going to show you today is far from what we know about AGNs. We, I'm going to show you what could cause these jets to get bent and bent by almost 90 degrees. This looks impossible from this schematic, but let's go and ask Miyaka to show us some images. But before then, let me provide you some background. So the object we'll be looking at is emerging galaxy cluster. We are thinking of two clusters of galaxies, okay? This is one cluster, a big one that is a small one. Imagine that the mass of these two galaxy clusters, each tiny dot you see there is a galaxy like ours, okay? Imagine that their mass ratio is one is to 10. So if that guy is 1 million solar masses, this will be 10 million solar masses. That's just what I mean. So the mass ratio is 1 is to 10. If you are to have them merge together and form a single um, galaxy cluster, then one of the greatest things you would see is those yellowish material you saw in the center, which we call um, 
which we observe in the X-ray, they are plasma. It's just ionized particles, very hot material. Okay? So this plasma can move. So it definitely does have gas motion because this is the matching scenario of two galaxy clusters. So I'm going to show you two phenomena that such um, sloshing induced gas motion. By sloshing, you, you remember when you pour your water, it just splashes on the ground and then bounces off and creates some effect, some shocks. So in a merging scenario, you can create what we call cold fronts. I will explain it. And these cold fronts are just evidence that you have magnetic field. Remember in the magnetic, oh, sorry, in the galaxy cluster, for example, in this one, there is magnetic field lines everywhere within the galaxy cluster. Also, as they merge, there are magnetic field lines scattered everywhere. Now, if you take a magnetic field line and compress it, imagine you can sweep it together by some kind of force, then you're going to increase the number of field lines around the compressed area. So that will increase the magnetic field strength around this thin compressed patch. So that's what we're calling cold front, actually. They are compressed magnetic field lines. And the way we detect this in real observations is to observe at the X-ray wavelength, okay? If you observe with X-ray, that's, this is one example, which is a galaxy cluster. And you measure the temperature from the center of the X-ray emission towards the outskirts. Of course, the temperature you can measure as counts, okay? The number of electrons per area. So you can measure those counts and move radially outward. So if you do that from the center, you see this exponential decay as expected for a collisional plasma because there'll be more collision in the center because there is more um, particles near the center of the galaxy cluster. And this will decay as you go outward because there is now less collision. So there'll be cooler, this will be cooler or there'll be less um, number of hot plasma as you move outward. So you expect this to just keep decaying exponentially as you go outward, but that's not true. You get to some point, you see a kink where this deviates from the expected decay that should just fall off slowly as you move from the center. What this means is that you have just hit an area where the temperature is just suddenly low. The temperature, instead of decaying exponentially, just suddenly cuts off. That cutting off is simply an evidence, we call it cold front, but this is an evidence of the presence of magnetic field. And that has been proven in some papers um, that I have shown here. This magnetic field strength can be between six to 14 micro gauss. Uh, there has been a result showing it can be even greater than 20 micro gauss. So it can be really, really strong depending on how much compression uh, created the magnetic field layer. Why are we talking about cold fronts and magnetic field and not black holes? I want to show you that you can use X-ray observation to find where there is high magnetic field strength. So the layer where you detect this kink is evidence that the magnetic field strength around there is higher than usual. But what could cause higher magnetic field? I have mentioned it before. It is something we call magnetic draping. Imagine you can wrap something around your arm. Um, okay, let me give another example. You are in the beach and then you put your feet in the soft sand and drag it forward. You will notice that you have created a heap of sand just above your toe, you make a nice arc shape with lots of sand making this nice arc structure. So that is equivalent to what we call magnetic draping.
So you have magnetic field lines here, and you have subcluster motion. If you have part of the cluster that is moving, like the hot plasma we have in the middle, this will hit these magnetic field lines, compress it, and have them wrap around it and increase the strength of the magnetic field here. You can see this in this um, ASAI um, simulation, which shows that this subcluster material can actually cause magnetic draping. Therefore, you have strong magnetic field around this area where there is wrapping around of the magnetic field. Remember, it's compressed. And here is the evidence um, in the simulation. Uh, you can see a few more. If you have this uh, subcluster motion, then you see magnetic field lines will concentrate more around the edges, creating this nice arc structure. So this is the simulation showing you evidence of how to create this magnetic field. Remember, this is intra-cluster magnetic field. This is magnetic field within the galaxy cluster or the emerging galaxy cluster. Awesome. So we have nailed that you can detect cold front in X-ray. And I've shown you evidence that these cold fronts are just magnetic field that are compressed through magnetic dripping. Now let's go to the emerging galaxy cluster of interest. This source is called Ebel3376. It's a very famous galaxy cluster. There has been many observations in the radio, in optical, uh, in neutral hydrogen at 21 centimeters. There has been a couple of simulations, some of which I will show you today. And there is also a number of X-ray observations. And the image you see here, um, the contours are radio continuum taking with the very large array in Socorro in uh, New Mexico in the United States. So this is radio continuum emission. You can see some of it right there. And you can see a second one. We call these radio relics. I'm not going to focus my talk on that so I don't run over time. And the background is S-ray emission. Remember, this is the hot plasma giving out um, uh, X-ray radiation, which you can pick up with X-ray telescope in space. And the center of these two merging galaxy cluster is here. The interesting thing we see is this elongated structure. I, I, saw, I listened to Ruby giving a talk about how to write a science paper. One of the best tools you have for your science is your eyes. If you see something, don't ignore it. Why is this long? Well, there has been a simulation by Machado et al. put into a small galaxy cluster and a bigger one with match ratio of one to 10, as I told you earlier, and allowing them to collide over a certain time scale. Okay, so after a few giga years, then you will see this create some shock fronts in the collision. And gradually you see this smaller core that run into the big one, creates some uh, hot plasma that reproduces this morphology. Okay, so this is just a flip around of the same morphology we see here. So in the nature paper, I'll show you earlier on this kind of effect is called slingshot. I'm just going to get to the end and show you right there that you're able to reproduce what you see in real observation is the same shape that this simulation produces after 1.6 giga years, which is beautiful. Uh, the fact that we can have um, simulation, theoretical simulation, reproduce the results you see from observations, that's really awesome. Okay. And then uh, using the same X-ray observations or X-ray image I've shown you earlier, which has this morphology, uh, on Dampileta in 2018, measured the temperature gradients from the peak position here outward and found a cold front here. Okay. 
Remember what cold front is, this is just region of compressed magnetic field. And that is actually realistic considering the fact that you see this, this guy is moving. So every magnetic field line here will be compressed, okay? Based on the simulation that I showed you earlier on. And um, Akamatsu also found another cold front somewhere there. So this MRC um, 0600 radio galaxy was detected with the VLA, but they didn't have high enough angular resolution. The resolution of the VLA was two of eight seconds. The resolution of Miyakad's image that we made was around 5.4 arc seconds. And that's our Miyakad's image. You can see nicely we re uh, reproduce the relics Okay, the purple colored things you see are the radio. The um, sky blue ones is the S ray, and the background is optical. So these are the two radio relics the Eastern relic and the Western relic. But I'm not going to discuss the science of the relics, I'm going to focus on this radio galaxy. If you zoom in, this is what we see of that radio galaxy. Impressive morphology which we need to carefully, carefully think about. First, there are two galaxies, the MRC 0600-399 and Galaxy B, okay? We will not focus much on Galaxy B, uh, but I can tell you that this galaxy has the same morphology as galaxies we call um, wide angle tail galaxies. This is because they usually have at the end of their jet, some plume structure, which you can see in this. So I won't focus on this, we pay attention to this guy. So first, the optical counterpart or the position of the black hole is the cross, okay? The magenta cross you see there. And this launches a, a jet, as I showed you in the first slide, that travels fairly north south. Now, the interesting thing is this emission, synchrotron emission that we detect here and also to the south. If you look at the scales, the length of this really collimated synchrotron emission is about 100 kiloparsecs. This length is long enough to cover this length here. So it means something is really happening to the electrons around here. Also, the bending, of course, is a very interesting um, structure that we have seen from the Miyakat image. That happens both to the north and to the south. That's not all. There is also these faint emissions. You can see them like fingers pointing backwards and a few things pointing outward. For this one pointing backward and the long one pointing forward, um, we use the name double sight. This is English, but the inspiration for this name was drawn from this Japanese animation, which has a sword. So I don't like violent games, but it just looks like what we're seeing. So we used it. So that is pointing backwards. This is like this part of this is that part. And this long part is this part. So that's where the name double sight structure came from. And we see it on both the northern part and the southern part. And the part marked with red are the spots where uh, the bending of the jet is happening. Good, so we see a jet getting bent. Of course, the first thing to do is to check if this emission is excited by something else and not this galaxy. But there is nothing else within this visibility, vicinity. Um, therefore, the emission we see here is associated with this black hole. So that's the interesting thing Miyakat has shown us. But of course, getting observation, writing a proposal, getting telescope time, spending many months processing the data is not all. If you show people this image, what they will say, wow, this is beautiful, fancy, nice. Okay, but that, that doesn't speak science. The real science comes in analyzing by analyzing, not reducing the data, I mean carrying out data analysis and bringing out the 
concentrated science that is hidden in that data. How can we do that? Well, one way is to first of all, check that what you are looking at corresponds to what exists already. For example, I showed you that on that later found a code front here and Akamatu found code front there. So if you think this is now a continuous bend of cold front traveling this direction, which I have illustrated here, then it makes sense that this jet is interacting with this cold front and then getting bent in this direction. But you want to note, um, I'm going to use a term that I will explain. This movement in this direction is against what we call ramp pressure. If I go back one step, remember that in the motion of this X-ray emission, it's going this direction, right? So if there is pressure on the motion going this way, that pressure should be opposite in direction. So if ramp pressure is responsible for the bending of the jet, then this bent arm should rather bend the other way around and not in this direction. This is what drew our interest to this because the cluster motion, the propagation direction is in this direction. So which means ramp pressure or gas flow direction should be in that direction. And therefore should, the bench of the jet should be the other way around. That makes this source very interesting because it goes against expected um, scenario. Okay then you have to start exploring science. One of the science you can explore is spectra index. I'm not sure this has been mentioned so far in the school, but spectra index simply is how your flux density varies with your frequency. And the equation is usually that, well, in some books you will see this as S, you can also use F, F at certain frequency is proportional to frequency to the power minus alpha. This minus alpha is our spectra index value that we're interested in. So what that means is you can easily take a log of this, okay, and add a constant. If you take a log, log of F nu will now be equal to minus um, alpha log of nu plus some constant. So if you have multiple um, frequencies, okay, then you can plot a linear graph because the slope will just be minus alpha and the intercept to be C. We're interested in minus alpha, okay? So you need multiple frequency and multiple uh, flux densities at the corresponding frequencies. And Meerkat has wide bandwidth. The bandwidth of Miyakat is 858 mega, 56 megahertz. So which means we can split 856 megahertz into eight or 10 small bandwidths and make the images like you have seen of each chunk. Let's say it starts from um, 856 or let's say 800 to 900, okay? 900 to 1,000 megahertz, 1,000 to 1,100, and you image the center frequency of each of those blocks. If you do that, you'll get an image like this. You can see the corresponding frequencies of each of this image. Of course, if you want high um, sensitivity, I'm sure you must have been told that in radio astronomy that you need wide bandwidth, so you can combine all the bandwidth to get high sensitivity. But if you want to reconstruct the spectral index, you can split up the bandwidth into small chunks, make your images, measure the fluxes at each point, and fit a linear graph to it. Okay? And then you can reconstruct the spectral index map. So this would do by means of um, programming, where you can measure the flux for every pixel and then compute the spectral index. Well, we don't, because in this paper, we focused on this radio galaxy, we simply cut out this image around this area and reconstructed the spectral index. And that's what you see in the spectral index. Again, you get a fancy image of the distribution of spectral index 
uh, you see the main galaxy that is bent, you see the galaxy B, which we are not going to focus on. But what does what we're seeing mean? Okay, what you see here, if you put ellipses from this line shows where the black hole is. So anything to the top is not, and anything to the bottom side is south. So if you put ellipses around the center of this spectra index map and extract the average spectra index and plot it according to the number, let's say this is number one, two, three, four, okay? So that is spectral index profile. You will see as you move from the black hole, the spectral index, which is the blue one, decays. And also the flux decays. The flux is the red, the flux density. Now that's expected because if this black hole launches a jet, the jet is simply a relativistic electron, electrons moving at speed close to the speed of light and getting coupled in magnetic field. But some of these electrons are lost, okay? So as these photons escape, the intensity you measure will drop because the photons generating the intensities are escaping. Okay, so this is what we expect. That is normal that the spectral index will decay and the flux will decay as you move from the the position where the jet is launched to the end of the jet. However, if you get to this point and you measure the same thing for N2 region, this spectral index, instead of continuing to decay, flattens. And the flux, which you continue to decay, brightens and stays flat through N2. This means that something is causing the brightening of the synchrotron emission. And this happens only around the bend point, which we have defined as N2. And by the time you get to N3, this escape of electron continues again and you start seeing another decay. This is interesting and quite impressive. It is the same story for the southern part, but the reason why it is not as clear as the north is because of the inclination. Uh, can people see my, my video? I want to do a demonstration. Hello? Okay, I don't hear anything, but imagine that this is a jet. Uh, okay, too bad. So if you have a jet in this direction and you rotate it slightly, so the way you see the projected um, northern part is projected inward. So you don't see clearly this profile that you see for the north. That's just the explanation for while uh, you see a decay, but you don't see nicely this flattening at the bend point. But of course we see some brightening, okay? And we see a drop again, but this is an inclination problem. So it's just a problem of the projection. Great. So now you've analyzed the spectral index, you've seen clearly that something happened at the bend point. The next thing is to put this into, into some kind of simulation to see if you can extract the physics behind this. And we did what you call magnetohydrodynamical simulation and nicely reproduce the double side structure. This is this image here is not from Meerkat, this is from simulation. Okay, so we reproduce the double side structure. Remember in this case, in simulation case, we, we can rotate the jet as much as we want, okay? There is no problem with the projection because we can keep it at any projected angle that we want to keep it. So the, the cool thing is you can see this double side structure, which you see there, okay? Pointing this way and that way. That is nicely reproduced in the simulation. The other interesting thing is that we measure the profile. Remember the decay function I told you for the X-ray, okay? 
here the one the plot here is the observations that is from simulation so the s-ray will have a kink showing you cold front and the kink will correspond to the peak of the radio profile and that's the same thing we see uh, calculating the uh, x-ray profile from the simulation and radio emission profile from also the simulation so you see the kink um, also just corresponding to the peak of, of the radio profile, which is an exciting result from the simulation. Uh, this contribution was done by the Japanese. Okay, so if you extract more information from the simulation, for example, what we call Joe heating, this gives you an idea of how much uh, collision is responsible for the brightening of the emission. And the part where we have Joe heat to be very small around this chunk is exactly the point where the jet is bent. Okay. And every brightening you see above here comes as a result of magnetic reconnection. And this is just the current density profile from the simulation. Okay, discussing that will be too much science for you. And I will go to showing you a fancy movie. So if you have this magnetic draped line, okay, we already looked at this and how it could be formed. And you have your jet launched from here. Imagine that the magnetic field has a strength of 10 microgauss, which is in agreement with the uh, magnetic field that has been observed in other galaxy clusters, which I showed you earlier. Then this is what you get. You launch your jet at high velocity, it gets to this point, it's not able to fully tunnel through the magnetic field. It interacts with it. Here, there is brightening of the radio emission, and then some of it go to the west and the other ones go to the east. And that's how you produce the jet structure, well, the bent jet structure. And this is the first time uh, we are seeing clear cut evidence that mag magnetic field within the galaxy cluster can affect the member galaxies. Remember this galaxy is just one of the galaxies within the field. Okay, now to show you a fancy uh, simulation, if you put in your arch of magnetic field and there is the where your black hole is and it's going to launch a jet outward, we are going to look at this in four dimensions. Um, the three dimensions is X, Y, Z. The, the third one is time. Okay. So we call it 4D image. And because this is simulation, I'm going to show you in the movie a flip around so you can see what the inside of the jet looks like. So you launch a jet. It travels at ridiculous speed. Some of the electrons escape. You can see the intensity here will be less than the ones here. This is where the spectral index will drop. But here, when it starts interacting with the magnetic field, uh, you can see the, some of the magnetic field break and reconnect. Okay, We call that magnetic reconnection. That is what causes the brightening of this emission. And you see the electrons um, can see the double side structure. And you can see the stream of electrons coming from the black hole. So this is now being flipped this way so you can look in and see uh, the double side structure nicely from, from the inside. So they're still streaming electrons inside, billions of them. Um, and as a matter of fact, this simulation was made with the fastest astronomical computer in the world. It's called Artemis II. Look, uh, it's a Japanese computer. Sorry, I do a lot of Japanese things. Okay, so that's our double size structure. If you look inside the cocoon, you see nice uh, interaction, nice structures produced due to the interaction of the magnetic field. Okay, so I'm just going to let that run through for another 16 seconds. And that's the fancy result we produce. Jet, bent jet. So what exactly are we looking at? 
using this schematic, I'll put it simple. This brown line is a magnetic field line. Okay. And this field line is caused by magnetic dripping, okay, where the stop cluster compresses magnetic field and then generates a layer of strong magnetic field. Right there is the galaxy, wide angle tail galaxy, which is black hole somewhere there. And here is the galaxy of interest. The black hole is located where my cursor is, and it launches jet which interacts with this magnetic field and get bent and form this double side structure. So the, uh, these spots where there is brightening of the emission is just due to magnetic reconnection which, uh, caused by the interaction of the jet and the magnetic layer. And on this side, the relativistic electrons simply get coupled in this magnetic layer and propagates uh, along the magnetic field line. Of course, this will cause decay. This procedure here is similar to um, the electrons coupling in the magnetic field of the jet. So this and that are the same, and therefore we can find the spectra index decay, this decays and that decays in similar way, but dif the different slope just points to different strength of the magnetic field. Um, and this is just a screen grab of the paper published in Nature. I, I got this sometime on, in June. Um, if you look at the update again, I think it's still ranking between 98th percentile and the 99th percentile, just juggles between the two. So it means a lot of people are interested in this kind of science and um, showing you evidence that a jet from the black hole of MRC 0600399 is bent by the magnetic field lines um, in Ebel 3376. And happily, this is not um, an isolated case. Uh, these two papers, especially that one, um, were both published while our paper was in review. The, the Nature paper was submitted in September of 2020. I was only accepted in May, in April, and published in May. So the review process, I, I had Ruby explain that, can be hectic, um, especially with nature, because they have lots of stringent rules, like writing only 2,500 words. That is ridiculous to explain science. OK, so there are a lot more to come from, from this data. Remember, everything has only focused on the central um, galaxy, the galaxy that is bent. The rest of the data will be used for some other science, like looking at the uh, rotation measures, looking at the magnetic field, um, explaining details of the data analysis, studying the radio relics to the east and the west, checking if we can detect faint emission in the center of the emerging cluster, which you call radio halo, and also studying the neutral hydrogen emission from galaxies within this cluster. So there, are, there is much more to come from this. Um, if you're interested in galaxy cluster science and you want to play with this data, feel free to contact me. I have put in my contact in the first slide. And that's it. That's everything. Thanks.